What does it really take to master differential equations? The first thing you need to master is the language of differential equations. When you look at a differential equation, you should be able to immediately identify whether it's an ordinary or partial differential equation, whether it's linear or nonlinear, whether it's homogeneous or heterogeneous, and what its order is, first, second, third, and so on. Why does it matter? Because your ability to choose the right method depends on how you classify the equation. But that's not enough. You also need to know what type of problem you're trying to solve. Is it an initial value problem? Like a free fall with a fixed initial velocity? Or a wave oscillating with initial and final time described only by functions of space? Or maybe it's a population growth model with a fixed initial number of members. Is it a boundary value problem, like a free fall with a fixed initial altitude and final destination? Or a stationary wave with fixed boundaries? Or a population growth that has a physical limitation in space, like walls surrounding it? Or maybe it's both, initial and boundary value problem, or maybe neither. Understanding first the type of equation and the type of problem you are dealing with gives you the first part of the roadmap to look for solutions. So that's your goal in the first stage. Get fluent in differential equations, classification, and terminology. Second, exact solutions when possible. Once you know how to classify a differential equation using the appropriate terminology, the next step is to solve it when possible. For first-order equations, you should learn classic techniques like separation of variables, like in this simple example, where we separate y in the left-hand side from t in the right-hand side. You should also know how to integrate factors, like in this resistor-capacitor circuit that is discharging and charging in a periodic fashion. And you should also know methods for exact and homogeneous equations like when studying problems involving gravitational potential energy, for example. This is a pattern recognition game. Once you spot the structure, you know which method you need to use. But first, you need to train your eyes to do it. These techniques also apply to problems involving exponential decay or Newton's law of cooling, for example. And even though these are examples in physics, You'll see throughout this presentation how learning differential equations with at least a minimal knowledge of how to apply these concepts to real-life scenarios will be extremely useful. This subject becomes really complex really fast, so keeping a touch with reality is something very helpful, even if you are a pure mathematician. When we move to second-order equations and beyond, things get a bit more technical. These equations are especially useful in physics, where many processes can be modeled using second-order differential equations, but rarely with higher orders, even though there are few cases. Here, you'll need methods such as the characteristic equation for a linear constant coefficient ODs, like for a damped spring. Another method is reduction of order, like in a chain reaction in nuclear fission. You might also need to know how to work with undetermined coefficients, like in a forced and damped harmonic oscillator, or even the method of variation of parameters to handle non-homogeneous terms, like in a forced and damped harmonic oscillator with irregular forcing. Therefore, that's your goal in the second stage, be able to recognize solvable solutions and then solve them. Ah, and by the way, if you're wondering, we added the final version of this roadmap for mastering differential equations in the PDF link in the description, together with some extra things. So check it out. Also, if you're enjoying this video, please do not forget to like it and to subscribe to the channel. Third, rigorous foundation of differential equations, existence, uniqueness, and behavior. At this point, I have a confession to make. This right here should be the second point, because before looking for solutions of differential equations, you first need to make sure that they even exist, whether they are unique or not, and what kind of behavior they might have. Of course, I wanted to present the simple case of finding exact solutions first, because I believe that the theory of differential equations becomes much easier to learn this way. Now we are ready to explore the rigorous foundation of differential equations. 
but Sophia will be the one to tell you guys about it. The Picard-Lindelof theorem guarantees existence and uniqueness under certain smoothness conditions. In this initial value problem, we assume the function to be continuous in a certain rectangular domain, and we assume what is called the Lipschitz condition. Then the theorem says that there exists a unique solution. We won't get into the details here, but the Lipschitz condition is exactly what prevents the function from changing too drastically in the vertical direction. Another important result is Piano's theorem, which assures existence of solutions even when uniqueness can't be guaranteed. It assumes that f is continuous in a rectangular domain, just as before, but there is no Lipschitz condition this time. And the implication is that there is at least one solution locally. Beyond existence, we need to control and understand the growth or shape of solutions. For example, Gronwald's inequality helps us to establish bounds on how solutions evolve, especially in stability theory. This is typically used when you have a bound on a function, say the difference between two solutions, and want to show that it cannot grow too fast, or even that it must vanish, which implies that the solution is unique. After that, we have sturm luvy theory which deals with the actual structure of solutions, in particular eigenfunctions and orthogonality, which are very useful when trying to solve PDEs, like in systems involving vibrating strings and heat diffusion. A sturm luvy problem is a second-order linear differential equation of this form, with these boundary conditions. p of x and q of x are called coefficient functions. y are the eigenfunctions. Lambda are the eigenvalues and w of x is called the weight function. I know, looking at this equation written like that, it's hard to tell that this is a linear eigenvalue problem. Maybe you're more used to the linear operator language. If you want to make your intuition behind eigenvalue problems in linear algebra stronger, check out this video on the channel. But after finishing this one though, because we're about to see something really cool. We can rewrite the equation this way, and then we clearly see that this is the operator. The operator A, as we define here, is not only linear, but also a self-adjoint operator. A self-adjoint operator is a linear operator with real eigenvalues lambda. Each of these eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on, has their own eigenfunctions, y1, y2, and so on, associated with each of them. The eigenfunctions, yn of x, form a complete orthogonal basis in the infinite dimensional Hilbert space they live in. So here's the real power of the sturm luvy theory. Once you've found the eigenfunctions yn of x and eigenvalues lambda n of the self-adjoint operator A, you've essentially diagonalized the operator. And since these eigenfunctions form an orthogonal basis for the Hilbert space of solutions, we can express any solution u of x of a wide range of differential equations, including partial differential equations, as an infinite linear combination of these eigenfunctions, where each coefficient c depends on the initial or boundary conditions. Finally, for nonlinear systems, phase spaces are particularly important because they allow us to visualize complex behavior like chaos, for example. Instead of solving explicitly, we study the geometric behavior of solutions, such as equilibria, limit cycles, attractors, and so on. These tools tell us what's possible even before we try to compute anything. Of course, we couldn't cover all of the important results here, but if you master just the ones we talked about today, you'll be way ahead of most people to when it comes to tackling problems in differential equations. 4. Qualitative methods when solutions are intractable. Sometimes, solving a differential equation analytically is impossible, even though solutions do exist. In those cases, the best thing we can do is to study the features of the solutions, so that we can predict their behavior and draw insights. A great way of doing that is through direction fields and phase portraits. Now, we already briefly talked about phase spaces, but now we're introducing direction fields and phase portraits. What is the difference between them? Many people use the names interchangeably, as though they were the same thing. But if you're serious about wanting to master differential equations, you absolutely have to know the difference between them. If you want to support our work, consider becoming a member of the channel. Members have access to our full PDFs with exercises and extra explanations. If you'd like to be the first to receive updates about new courses and books, sign up with your email address on our website. Link in the description. Let's see an illustration. The Van der Poel Oscillator. You can tell by this guy's name that he was Dutch.
Balthazar van der Poel worked at Philips Research Labs in the early 20th century as a physicist and electrical engineer. While studying vacuum tubes, the kind used in old radios and amplifiers, he noticed a weird type of self-sustained oscillation, like a feedback loop, but non-linear, so it couldn't be modeled by the standard harmonic oscillator. This oscillation didn't die out or explode in amplitude. Instead, this oscillation settled into a steady rhythm, something that he later called a relaxation oscillation. To model this phenomenon mathematically, he derived the now famous van der Poel equation. This is a linear second-order differential equation that's simple to write, but impossible to solve explicitly. It's often rewritten as a first-order system. This equation introduces the concept of limit cycles which are closed trajectories in a phase space that attract or repel nearby motion. The phase space is the background stage where everything happens. The 2D plane, R2, with the horizontal axis representing position x and the vertical one representing velocity x dot. These curves here compose what we call the phase portrait of the system. These are solution trajectories. The arrows, or vectors, make up what we call the direction or slope field which indicates the slope of each solution curve at every point, essentially the vector field associated with the system. But still, knowing all of this is useless if just by looking at this diagram you're not able to interpret the equation accordingly. What does the parameter mu do? Mu controls both the nonlinearity and the damping, so the fact that the amplitude of oscillations decreases over time. If mu equals zero, the system becomes the classic simple harmonic oscillator, with purely circular motion in the phase space. If mu is greater than zero, the system has non-linear damping. Small oscillations grow, and large ones shrink, until the system stabilizes on a limit cycle, which is a closed loop that attracts all nearby trajectories. If mu is less than zero, the system has positive damping for all amplitudes. The origin is a globally stable fixed point, specifically a stable spiral. Trajectory spiral inward, toward the origin. Another important insight you can get from qualitative analysis is stability. So how sensitive a system is to small changes in its initial state? A common method is by approximating nonlinear systems near equilibrium points by a linear version of it, called linearization. Another method is the usage of Lyapunov functions, which are scalar functions that help us assess the stability of equilibrium in dynamical systems without solving it explicitly. The last qualitative method for studying differential equations that we'll talk about is bifurcation theory. Imagine placing a cylinder in a fluid. Then you start to slowly turn up the speed of the fluid. At first, the flow is smooth and steady, symmetrically wrapping around the cylinder without much fuss. It's stable. But as the flow speed that is tracked by the Reynolds number crosses a critical limit, something changes. The system becomes unstable, with a phenomenon called vortex shedding. The bifurcation appears in the graph at the point where the Reynolds number is about 47. With this, we conclude the fourth step to master differential equations, and we're ready to move on to the fifth. Fifth, numerical methods. When differential equations become too complex to solve analytically, especially for nonlinear systems, we turn to numerical methods. We use algorithms to compute approximate solutions at discrete points. One of the simplest is Euler's method, which takes tiny steps forward using the slope at each point to estimate solutions. When these steps tend to zero in the limit, we end up with a true phase portrait of all solutions, since our approximation converges to the correct trajectories. Euler's method is simple, but not very accurate, especially when using large step sizes with errors that can quickly accumulate. So you can imagine how costly, from the computational point of view, it might be to have very small step sizes just to get a reasonable approximation. A more accurate method is the improved Euler method, which produces a better estimate by calculating the average slope at each interval. Instead of just using the slope at the beginning of the step, it also includes the slope at the estimated end and the average of the two. This produces a result that converges faster to the true solution. Both Euler and improved Euler can be understood as approximations to the Taylor series expansion 
of the true solution y of t. Euler's method corresponds to a first-order Taylor expansion, since it uses only the first derivative. Improved Euler goes a step further by better approximating the slope over the interval, making it second-order accurate and much closer to the actual trajectory. Now, when it comes to mastering the most powerful and widely used methods for numerically approximating solutions to differential equations, you absolutely need to learn the runge kutta methods, which are among the best. These are a family of interactive techniques that build on the same idea, using slopes to take steps. The most famous version, runge kutta of order 4, or RK4, combines multiple slope evaluations within each step to achieve fourth-order accuracy. This means the error decreases much faster as you shrink the step size, which gives highly accurate approximations without needing extremely small steps. In practice, RK4 is usually considered the gold standard for solving ordinary differential equations numerically. Now, when working with partial differential equations, though, we often use finite difference methods, where we replace derivatives with differences across a grid in space and time. However, just getting an answer is not enough. We also need to see if we can trust it. That's where concepts like stability, convergence, and error analysis come in. They help us ensure that, as we refine our steps, making them smaller, our solution behaves consistently, getting closer to the true solution, rather than spiraling out of control because of numerical errors. This concludes our fifth step, numerical methods, and we're ready to move on to the last one. Partial differential equations are super important in mathematical physics. They describe how physical quantities like heat, wave displacement, or electrostatic potential evolve over both space and time. Some of the so-called canonical equations include the heat diffusion, modeling heat flow, the wave equation, modeling vibrations, and the Laplace equation, modeling steady state potentials. These equations describe systems involving multiple interacting variables. And that's the main difference compared to ODEs, ordinary differential equations. Those involve only one independent variable and its derivatives. To solve partial differential equations, mathematicians and physicists use analytical techniques such as separation of variables, which we have already seen before. Fourier series, which express complicated functions as sums of sines and cosines, so that it's easier to handle boundary conditions in periodic problems. And also, we have Green's functions, which describe the response of a system to a point source. The thing that all of these methods have in common is the goal of simplifying a complex problem by breaking it into smaller pieces. And the overall goal of partial differential equations in mathematical physics is to understand how these equations encode physical laws, and as a consequence, to predict future behaviors. Therefore, these are the six steps to master differential equations. First, the language of differential equations. Second, exact solutions when possible. Third, the rigorous foundation of differential equations. Fourth, qualitative methods when solutions are intractable. Fifth, numerical methods. And sixth, partial differential equations and mathematical physics. Now, if you want to practice each one of these steps, we left a few exercises in the full PDF version in the description, together with their detailed solutions. But if you want to know the top 25 differential equations in mathematical physics, check out this video right here. See you guys there.